Good morning. Thank you for joining with us in our virtual worship here at Peace United Church of Christ. We come from Fort Wayne, Indiana. My name is the Reverend Kristen Pettit Miller. It feels exciting that we will be gathering together in outdoor worship beginning on June 6th. So mark your calendars and be prepared to join us. Bring your lawn chairs and your blankets. We'll be meeting outside throughout the summer. If you are not able to meet us in online worship outside, then the online part will be sent to your homes, but it will just be sent later in the afternoon. We will still be recording worship so that you can be a part of the worship experience at peace. This morning, we celebrate Ascension Day. We talk a little about what that means for all of us. We're thankful to have you with us. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, God who gave us Jesus the Christ, who lived and walked and taught on this earth with us. Help us to understand his teachings. Help us to continue to bring the words of Christ alive today. Be with us in this time, wherever we are and wherever we are on faith's journey. Amen. from Acts 1 verses 1 through 11. Dear Theophilus, in my first book I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the time he began his work until the day he was taken up to heaven. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen as his apostles. For 40 days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. He saw them and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. And when they came together, he gave them this order. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, the times and the occasions are set by my father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who has taken from you, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. Here ends this reading. I have always felt a little bit sad for Ascension Day. Ascension Day doesn't get a lot of attention with Hallmark cards. People don't dress up for Ascension Day in white and leap in the air or do anything exciting. It's one of those days in the Christian calendar that we often just really don't pay a lot of attention to. And so I want to give you a little Ascension Day 101. Ascension Day is the day in which Jesus officially rose into heaven to be near God. Ascension Day always comes the week before Pentecost, which is when we celebrate the birthday of the church. We celebrate the Holy Spirit. And the Ascension Day actually falls 40 days after Easter. So it's in this kind of in-between time. Today, we're going to talk about the scripture that has to do with Ascension Day. And I'm going to try to make up for my nearly 49 years of Ascension, Ascension Day ignorance by doing some remedial theological conversation. Because whenever I get enthused about a theological topic, I preach about it. And then guess who gets to come along the journey with me? That's right, anyone who is watching this blog. The first chapter and first verse of the Acts of the Apostles was classically known as the definitive story of the Ascension. The writer of the book of Acts, who it is believed was also the writer of the book of Luke, was so amazed by the story that he actually wrote about it twice. Once in Luke, and then with more detail and four-part harmony, again in the book of Acts. And this is the scripture that we will be looking at this morning and that Chris read for us early today. So picture, if you will, a motley crew of assorted characters, a band of followers who had lost their leader and who were still wondering what their role was. I think of it sort of as the mice who lost the Pied Piper that they were following, or a beehive that doesn't have a queen bee. They were a rather scruffy band of field folks who had their hopes shattered by the death of this one who they were so certain was the Messiah. They had been in mourning for a good 40 days, a little over a month after watching Jesus die. And not only did he die, but he died in an incredibly violent and agonizing and cruel way. And I wonder if perhaps the disciples asked themselves, where God was when Jesus was dying. And then, puzzlingly, strangely, there had been that cryptic message from the angel at the tomb, depending on what gospel you read, 
And then there had been those sightings of him, which were hard to wrap your head around. While it seemed that Jesus was popping up here and there for at least a few people, or at least some people were telling them, there had been fleeting glimpses of Jesus seen, sort of like modern day Elvis sightings maybe. But there really hadn't been any clear directive to the disciples as a group together. There hadn't been any clear movement or direction that would be agreed upon by all of them. There was not a master plan. There wasn't a mission statement. There wasn't a grand vision. There were just some folks who were scattered here and there, still living under the Roman Empire's rule, aimlessly wondering what was next for them and what they should do with this time remaining on earth. And then, lo and behold, there was a sign. Out of nowhere, word came from this one who they knew as the Messiah, speaking on behalf of their God. Jesus appeared to the disciples and told them not to leave Jerusalem. They were to stay put. They were to hang tight. They were to just wait patiently because something really exciting and unanticipated was on the horizon. The baptism of what was known as the Holy Spirit. I like thinking about the disciples of this time. And forgive me, because at times I have sort of an irreverent picture of them. I at least know what I would feel. What I would feel if I were left in this in-between time, not being certain, not being certain that I could trust that the person that I was closest to in a group told me that they saw Jesus. Would I believe them or not believe them? Would I be muttering to myself? Would I be wondering if maybe I had spent some time doing the wrong thing following this teacher? I think there would have been some very honest questions going on. Not entirely understanding, not entirely understanding Jesus' drift, perhaps, but still feeling the need to act and maybe remembering that time that was sacred when he was on the earth. Perhaps I see the disciples this way because that's what I might be doing. Laughing along with jokes I don't quite get and wanting desperately, desperately for something to come and give me hope. The disciples didn't understand, not yet. They asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will come to restore the kingdom of heaven? It's such an eager question. And the response that they got was a perplexing one. Instead of answering the question, he told them politely that the coming of the kingdom of heaven is in God's hands. Jesus doesn't give a yes or no answer here. He won't give them an exact date and time and then encourage them to hand over their savings accounts so that he might create billboards and pass out flyers so that they might carry on and get everyone on board with them. Instead, what Jesus said is this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And I wonder what the disciples thought of that response. Did they understand? Did they furrow their brows and scratch their heads? Did it make sense to them? Does it make sense to the disciples who live 2,000 plus years later? Jesus' response 
was a crafty one. If I were a disciple, I might have been inclined to want to grab his shoulders and say, answer the question, I just need answers. Are you here or are you not here to restore the kingdom? But we all know that Jesus has a wisdom which offers a depth that mere mortals like me and like you don't understand often. The fact that Jesus didn't answer the question and that he moved on to another topic makes me think that the disciples may have been asking the wrong question. For if the disciples were simply continuing to hope for a cosmic ruler who would command the people and bring a new kingdom, if they're simply looking out into the distance and waiting for this brand new, beautiful, sparkling world, then they're missing the point, aren't they? They're looking in the wrong place. The kingdom language, or as many of us feel more comfortable talking about it, the kingdom language, that of being kin and community to one another, that was spoken throughout Jesus's life and throughout his ministry was never about another place and time. This language, this kingdom language, that Jesus uses has always had much more to do with how we followers of Jesus bring the community of God here today and tomorrow. And the job of furthering the mission, the task of ushering in the community of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, is really the responsibility of us all. This community of God is ushered in when we love. This reign of God is realized when we go about creating spaces of sanctuary for those in need. This world of God is alive here and now when we genuinely forgive, when we practice compassion, when we offer tenderness. And this time, this kingdom, it's not about tomorrow. It's not about looking up it's about today, and it's about looking all around us. Listen to Jesus' response to his disciples again. Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What he says in the common vernacular is, it's not just about me, friends. This work, this work you're going to be doing is ushering the community of God to the world all around you. Turn around and look, because it's right here. And it's up to you now, too. I can't do it alone. And then after these words, he was gone. As the disciples watched, he was lifted into a cloud. He ascended. And that was the first ascension day. And the disciples were left with his words and with a mission. But there's one more part of the story that I really love. The part that assures me 
that God has a wonderful sense of humor and a sparkle in God's eye, as well as the patience to get through to even the densest of his followers, which sometimes I think I am. While the disciples are still standing there looking up, gazing heavenward, two men show up. Two new men who weren't part of the story. Two mysterious men in robes. And they ask pointedly to the disciples, looking up, why do you stand looking up to heaven? And the disciples must have wanted to point at Jesus' still rising feet and saying, well, look. But the question seems to be the moral of the story, the way it all sums up. The question, why are you standing there looking up? Why are you waiting? Why are you focusing so much on this next world when we're right here? When there are people right in front of you who you could be telling the stories of Jesus about. When there are people right in front of you who are hungry. Why do you stand looking up when there may be a beggar right at your feet? When there may be someone who is blind, who needs to be held and led or healed? Why are we looking up? Why are we still looking up, waiting for this world that's coming next? How about if instead we look all around us? The community of God still needs to be ushered in here. It's not going to get done if we spend a lot of time standing here, staring at the sky and asking God what's next. I find it ironic that when the church, and I mean that church with a capital C, the worldwide church, celebrates ascension, they spend much more time considering the rising. When I think what the writer of Acts is documenting are the words spoken from the lips of Jesus, our teacher. It seems to have to do with what witness Jesus calls to happen down here in this world where he lived, in this place where he ministered. Friends, there is a really, really hungry world waiting for our gifts. And the followers of Jesus don't have the luxury of resting on our haunches. There is a planet which needs our attention. And the followers of Jesus can't simply ignore it while we wait for the next heavenly realm to come and replace it. Friends, justice is still slow to come to our nation. And we can't just sit around while our black and brown brothers and sisters are fighting a struggle. Friends, our transgender brothers and sisters, our gay, lesbian, bisexual, non-binary friends are asking for justice and witnesses. And we can't just sit around and tell them that the answers will come when Jesus returns. The followers of Christ aren't permitted to excuse ourselves from what happens here, even if sometimes it would feel easier if we could. And so what do we do? We stand together, arm in arm. We imbibe the power of the Holy Spirit. We cast our gaze fleetingly at the Christ who rose, but then we get back to work building the community that Jesus preached about 
here on this ground, just as Jesus did in his ministry. I want to close by sharing with the words of a Nicaraguan song that was taught to me when I was in college. The words to the song are these. I am sent by God. My hands, they are ready, ready to build a peaceful, loving world. The angels, they were not sent to change a world of pain into a world of peace. God has called me. God wants me to create this reality. Help me, God, to do your work. In the name of Jesus the Christ, may it be so. Amen. I invite you into a time of prayer together. Let us pray. O oh God, in the stillness of these moments, we come to you. You are as near to us as our own breathing. You live in our innermost thoughts. You show up in our deepest yearnings for hope. You meet us exactly where we are. Our confession may be that we miss your presence too often. There is so much going on in the busyness of our lives that we forget to stop. Forgive us when our eyes are blind. Forgive us when our hearts are hardened. Clear our vision that we may look all around us and see your world, your world ready for us. Touch us when we are unfeeling. Prod us when we are stubborn. Forgive us that we may learn to forgive others. Move among all of creation. We are your children, and we ask for your grace. In the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen.